right. Hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Johannes Wilbert, as kindly introduced uh, by Mo. And today I'm presenting to you Cracking the Final Frontier, Reverse Engineering and Exploiting Low Earth Orbit Satellites. If we could, yes, perfect. So quick introduction about me, so that you know who is talking to you about satellite stuff. Um, I'm, a, I'm a satellite and space system security researcher. I'm a doctoral student at the Ruhr University Bochum in Germany. I'm a co-founder of the SpaceX workshop. That's a new academic workshop on satellite security that was previously co-located with NDSS. And I was previously a visiting researcher at uh, Arma Swiss in Switzerland at the Cyber Defense Campus. And I did some, some more satellite security research there, more focused on user segment modems, not so much on satellites itself. And basically everything that you will be hearing in the talk is based on a research paper that we recently published at the IEEE Symposium on Security and Privacy. Um, it's called Space Odyssey, an Experimental Security Analysis of Satellites. So if you want to get more information, for example, on more satellites, because the talk will be about one satellite, and in total we analyzed three satellites, uh, feel free to read the paper. It also won a distinguished paper award, if uh, that helps you read the paper. And with that, let's go to the actual talk. So why is our satellites even an interesting topic? So satellites and satellite services have become a pretty vital part of our modern lives. Um, starting by telecommunications for, for example, TV services, internet services, and also upcoming phone services that are supposed to be coming from space and not from these like large cell phone towers anymore. Global positioning services like GPS, Galileo, GLONASS, and so on, that are used on basically everyone's mobile phone and shipping on airplanes basically everywhere. And Earth observation images that are used in and mapping services for weather forecasting, for agricultural forecasting, and many more. And there are even research opportunities, scientific research opportunities for, for example, astronomers, and technology testing opportunities to test new stuff in space. So satellites have a pretty large area of application. And to do this, they use, well, satellites in space. And satellites can be in pretty different locations in space. And all the satellites that we will be talking in this talk are in the so-called LEO in the low Earth orbit, which is usually from like 160 kilometers to around 2,000 kilometers. But this definition might vary on where you're reading this from. For example, ESA just says until 1,000 kilometers. And for reference, like for example, the International Space Station is around 400 kilometers, I think. And most of the LEO stuff happens between four and 800 kilometers. If you try to go past that with satellites and a lot further, you're going to have big issues because you suddenly need to build a lot bigger satellites that uh, need to withstand a lot more radiation because in a LEO orbit you're still in like a radiation belt and as soon as you go out there it all becomes a lot more expensive. You need more rocket fuel, you need more parts for the satellite itself. So if you want to place, for example, a GPS satellite, which are usually placed in a mid medium Earth orbit at around 2,000 to 35,000 kilometers, uh, then you need a lot more money and resources to put a satellite there. Sure, you could also go up to the geostationary orbit, which is precisely at 35,786 kilometers, it's and it's always about, uh, like, right above one specific point on Earth. That's why it's geostationary. Um, but when you place satellites there, you come into different issues like timing, like when you have a signal round trip time to the satellites, you're approaching one second of delay, which is suboptimal for many modern services. Um, so these satellites are composed in the so-called space segment. So if you have one satellite, then the space segment is composed of a single satellite. If you have more satellites, like a con constellation like Starlink or OneWeb, then you have multiple satellites, and all of these satellites are connected by an inter-satellite link. The satellite that we will be looking at is, for example, a 3U CubeSat from ESA, and it's actually rather small, with just 10 by 35 by 10 centimeters. Um, and this is also many of the newer satellites that are the so-called new space era are in basically this format. So they, they are really small. They're not these gigantic satellites anymore that you might have seen on the news or in uh, previous times. And these satellites are controlled by the so-called ground segment. So the ground segment is composed of a crew of operators that actually control the entire space segment and the, the satellite service itself. So the ground segment has like the dual use of one upcasting telecommand and control traffic, but also the actual user segment service. And these ground stations can be pretty large, like they can be gigantic antennas of like 50 meters or whatever, but they can also be pretty small. Like this is a ground station in the Technical University of Berlin with a human for scale. 
um, and they can be just two meters and the budget for these general ground stations can be as low as like 10,000, which um, makes it pretty interesting for attackers since now with just around $10,000, you can already talk to low Earth orbit satellites, which is pretty interesting. And the ground segment uses the so-called space protocol and we will be going through several of them in this talk um, to actually command and control the satellites. Um, and the actual like user services we received in the user segment, and the user segment is basically a collection of all devices that can receive a satellite service. So for example, your mobile phones, um, your, your TV antenna that can receive like the, the dishes that you will put up on your roof. Um, and these basically compose all these uh, devices that receive a service. For example, also a Starlink antenna. All right, what will be this talk about? Like what can you, can you expect from this talk? We're first going to introduce, or I'm going to first to introduce firmware attacks on satellites. And I'm starting by explaining what satellite or firmware attacks on satellites are not by, com by a well-known example. And um, in the next step, I will be going through a system analysis of one satellite. And basically, I'm going through what the satellite can do. And I'm going through all the protocols that it can use. I'm going through the telecommand and telemetry stack. Um, actually, there are two stacks on the satellite. And I will be going through each of the parts. And um, I'll, show you, I'll be showing you how a satellite works, because at the end of the day, it's rocket science, but not really rocket science. Like It's, it's a, an embedded device, so not much magic going on. Um, then w I'm doing a quick security, well, not so quick, security analysis of the satellites. So I'm going to show you several issues and vulnerabilities in the code. And we'll be chaining them together to use whatever we learned from the firmware attacks in the very beginning in the security analysis to present your live demo, uh, where I try to like exploit a digital twin of a satellite here on my laptop. And you can hopefully see that if that works. Um, and in this live demo, I'll be trying to exploit a satellite and basically patch in a new authentication mechanism so that we have a new satellite. All right, let's start with firmware attacks on satellites. What even is the concept behind that? Let's first start by what it isn't. So you probably all heard about the so-called Viasat incident that happened after the first day of Ukraine, um, where hackers took over parts of satellite modems and like many wind parks in, for example, northern Germany were shut down. And it was like hyped as a big satellite security topic. Um, but when you actually look in the details, it has nothing to do with what I'm presenting here. Um, it's just the name, name, same name satellite security, but since so many people have brought it to my attention and asked about it, I thought I'll be quickly explaining this, why it's not that. So in this Viasat incident, these people basically came from the internet and they compromised ground station services that were exposed to the internet. So they took over parts of the ground station system, or well, not really the ground station, but the, the part that is upcasting the internet traffic, and then from there distributed likely malware to the user segments. And as you can see, the thing that is really pretty much irrelevant at this point is the satellite itself, because it, it acts as dump pipe. It's just taking the whatever traffic it gets, it doesn't decode it, it just rebroadcasts it at a slightly different frequency because uplink and downlink frequencies are different. And really the attack would have been basically the same if there would have been a cable, not a satellite. Um, but this makes it a satellite security topic. So um, yeah, but has nothing to do with, with what we are doing here. Um, Firmware attacks on satellites are much more about an attacker having its own ground station, for example, the small one that I previously showed you, and talking directly to a satellite, and then exploiting one or more vulnerabilities on a satellite or just missing security measures in the first place um, to do several, uh, to do usual software attacks on the satellite itself. So um, really pretty different. And this concept itself is not really novel. So there have been so many reports where they stated that you should be looking at software security of satellites, um, but it was never really addressed. It was always stated, yeah, you, you can take over a satellite. Like probably since the 90s, people stated it. And um, at least in the public domain, nobody really cared. Like probably uh, militaries cared about it more, but um, well, I don't have insights into that. Um, so quickly about the attacker model that we'll be using here. We're assuming some attacker that has like a ground station that most people here could just purchase online. They know exactly where the satellite is. They know the exact frequency modulation, which is uh, might be a fair assumption. Many of the frequencies have to be published, for example, for FCC grants. Um, on the modulation, well, there, there are not that many, so you might be able to guess it. The location is known. You can look it up for any satellite in space. Um, another thing that we are assuming that is probably a lot harder is access to the actual firmware of the satellite. Um, I'll be going through how we got it. Um, 
but that is like kind of an attacker model that we, th that we think makes sense since more and more of the satellites component move to like components of the shelves. So more and more parts of the satellite software might be known. So that is certainly something that people should consider. So let's talk about what kind of attacker goals you can achieve with these firmware attacks. Obviously, can, you can do a denial of service. That's today the most used like satellite attack of all. Like w ultimately, if the, the satellite can't produce its service, it's pretty pointless up in space. Another attack vector would be malicious data interaction. So assume you have like an Earth observation satellite and you want to see the and you want to tamper with the images on the satellite. Um, that might be pretty interesting for an attacker to introducing or removing artifacts um, in a, for example, in a conflict. Um, Certainly pretty interesting, but we'll be looking at seizure of control. So if you never had a satellite and you want a satellite, that's what you have to do. And that's what we will be looking at. So where to achieve command, at command and control or really seizure of control of a satellite? So generally, satellites are composed of, of two big parts. We have a bus system and a payload system. The payload system is whatever, is whatever equipment the, the satellite carries for its service. So it might be a big... Uh, camera for Earth observation, it might be big tele uh, radio, radio frequency equipment for telecommunications. So really it's uh, the, the point why the satellite is up there. And then there is the bus system, um, which allows to like basically keep the satellite alive in space. And the payload is where you can, for example, achieve these like data, malicious data interactions that I just talked about. When you, for, for example, want to change the images on a satellite, that's where you do it. If you want to do, for example, denial of service, that's where you do it. Um, but it's not quite so clear wh where you would achieve full seizure of control, since the payload itself, while well, taking camera, is not really full seizure of control of the satellite. For that, we have to look actually into what the bus system is. So the bus system com consists of a lot of components with a lot of acronyms. Like space people really like their acronyms. Um, for example, it has an attitude determination control system, which basically turns the satellite towards Earth or Sun, and basically you can rotate it in different directions. There's an electrical power supply, which is usually battery and usually solar panels. Um, then there is a command and data handling system, which is a micro usually a microprocessor, which runs the firmware that we'll be looking at. And you have a comm system, which is usually some kind of communication system in the VHF, UHF, S-band, frequency band. So really, if you want to take over the satellite, you have to gain control of the command and data handling system. So this is the system that handles any telemetry, any telecommands that come from the ground station to the satellite. So and how does this control flow work? So we have telecommands, and I've mentioned this so many times, but never actually explained what it is. So a telecommand is a whatever instructions you want to send to the satellite. So for example, rotate, turn on this device, turn off this, uh, turn off this device, start logging this, start sending this, whatever. It might, might be all kinds of stuff. And the telecommand arrives at the communications module, and there it's decoded, hopefully authenticated, but we'll see about that. Um, and it's repackaged, for example, to some other kind of command that this command and data handling system understands, and the command and data handling system then passes the command, executes it, and responds with some kind of telemetry. And the command and data handling system then instructs all the other components, like the attitude and the, like the ADCS, the electrical power supply system, and the actual payload. So really, the CDHS is basically the top of the like hierarchy. If you take control of it, you got control over pretty much everything. Um, and then there might be actually more antennas, multiple antennas. So most satellites, for example, when you think of a like Starlink satellite um, or other telecommunication satellites, usually they have, for example, two antennas. Um, Starlink was a bad example. I don't actually know how Starlink is doing it. Um, but usually they have two antennas, for example, then you have an S-band antenna or UHF, VHF antenna for like telecommand and control. And then you might have a different antenna that is also having um, command and control for, for a payload. So for example, there is a satellite up in space that has actually multiple payloads of multiple different customers. Then you might have multiple telecommands and control things, but let's not talk about this right now. So what might, the, mm, what might be the attack path through the, through the satellite? So obviously, as an attacker, you would arrive at, for example, a communication system. You would propagate your attack to the command and data handling system, and you would take full control of the bus system. You can't really take control of the bus system from the payload per se. You can only escalate your attack uh, vertically, laterally, from the, uh, communications, uh, from the payload communication system to the payload data handling system to the command and data handling system. So that is a way. 
Um, and many people actually looked so far at these like payload attacks, for example, the Hexizard competition in, uh, in Europe that was this year and last year. Um, there is an online article where somebody looked at the same satellite that we will be looking at, at this ESA satellite OPSAT. And there was also a talk at CISAR 2023 from Matteo Calabrese, who also did the live exploitation of the payload. But we'll be looking at the bus. Um, and there, there are basically many things that you have to achieve to get full control of this satellite. First, you have to basically bypass whatever COM protection there is. And the first thing and the easiest might be if there is just missing access control at all. Um, far more common than you might think. Um, there might be just insecure and super outdated protocols be because many of these satellites are pretty old or because they use pretty outdated components for whatever reasons. The crypto might be outdated. There might be timing side channels, also many things to bypass this COM protection. The next step, you want to basically de deploy whatever payload you have on your command and data handling system. You could say the easiest thing would be, well, do a firmware update if you, if you already can execute any command. Um, but that's actually not so easy for several reasons. First, the image oh, sorry, might be signed. Um, not so much of an issue, maybe, but you have really slow uploads sometimes. Many of the satellites just have a VHF or UHF link. So this is around nine kilobytes per second. And your time window, because before the satellite crosses the horizon again, is around 10 minutes. So you have 10 minutes to upload your stuff. And if you have like a multi-megabyte image, make a calculations. That might take some time. Actually, it might take days or even weeks for people to upload new s images. Um, also, these, like building a full new working firmware images for, for like a device that has 20 peripherals and five redundancies of everything is not super easy. And it's hard on, on Earth. And if you try to do it on, on some random people's satellite in space, that might not be the, the way to success. So. What else we can do is, for example, find dangerous telecommands that try to do stuff that you're not supposed to do, like writing memory, or you find vulnerable telecommands that just have an outright vulnerability, which is what we will be doing here. And finally, at the bus itself, you have to hijack the bus control flow and gain full bus privileges, stuff you all probably know. And if you do all that, then you got yourself a new satellite. Yeah. All right, so to conclude, we want to find a bypass com protection, a dangerous or vulnerable telecommand. We want to find, uh, or we wanted to hijack the bus control flow, and finally we want to gain full bus privileges. And if we do all these things, then we are successful. All right. So how do we get firmware access in the first place? Um, usually we just take our Starship from the chair. Um, it was kindly bought to, to for us from our professor. Then you go up in space to whatever space station you have, and then you just dump the software. Uh, in reali reality, that's unfortunately not the case yet. So you have to talk to people. Um, and you have to talk to a lot of people, and you can ask for their s software. For example, ESA gave it to us. Um, you can ask other institutions. They might give it to you under an NDA. It also sometimes works. Or you can talk to a lot of people and like build collaborations, and then maybe they give software to you. Um, but satellite developers are pretty reluctant to give software out because most of the like security is still security by obscurity. So you don't know how this telecommand protocol works. So that's why you can't access the satellite. It's not encryption, it's not authentication, it's you don't know how it works, so you can't do it. So these people are usually pretty reluctant to giving out software. And it's even harder if you try to publish it like we did. Um, but that's the only way you can really do, unless you have super fancy spy satellites that I don't know of. Okay, so what's, what was our approach? Um, we did usually, or on all three images that we looked at, we did a manual reversing, reverse engineering, we looked at any underlying system design. We found some pretty rare target architectures, like for example, AVR32, which uh, will be the main or some part of this talk. Um, there are many new protocols that I've never seen before uh, that I have to had to look up, and redundancies also make stuff pretty nasty. Uh, we did a manual vulnerability analysis, so we looked at, we went through the telecommand uh, data pass. We're looking for missing security act, um, measures. We were looking at dangerous TC actions, so if you can write a memory that is like intended to be as an action, and we were looking for like low-hanging fruits like malicious mem copies, string copies with an out size field, whatever. And we uh, we also did some automated fast testing. Um, there was a problem. Well, there's maybe just not a, even an emulator for whatever architecture we're looking at. Um, but more about that at TyphoonCon, because there will be a talk about fuzzing the same satellites. All right, so let's jump into the system analysis of, the e of ESA's OPSAT. So ESA's OPSAT is an experimental satellite that is operated by ESA, and it's pretty much open for research. So everybody here can basically go on GitHub, download their like, Java framework, and write an experiment in it. 
And then you can send it to ESA with like a small piece of paper what you want to do, and then they might upload it after a code review onto the satellite. And it has a lot of peripherals, like it has an S-band antenna, X-band, SDR, optical receiver, camera, and like dozens of other stuff. And the payload itself is like an ARM-based Linux plus an FPGA, not the bus, that's something different. And it was launched in 2019. And the system chart basically looks like this. We have in the upper part the bus system that I have mentioned uh, several times now already. So we have the communication system, command data handling system, and so on. And we also have a GPS system. And then the lower part is the payload, so really what the satellite is uh, supposed to do in space. We have this X-band, S-band, and so on. All right, so next, next, let's jump into the actual system chart of the whole thing. So this is basically the chart of from antenna to antenna, from receiving a telecommand to processing it, to emitting telemetry, to sending it back to Earth. So we will be going through most of these parts, so don't worry, you don't have to read this right now. Um, but you can already see we have basically two main telecommand and uh, telecommand command and control channel path, let's say it like that, two stacks. Uh, the upper path and the lower path, and we will be going through each of the components now. All right, so we start with the upper part. Um, no. And basically, first we have the UHF antenna, and we are receiving the signal from our... Um, Sorry, we, we have the I2C bus, we have a UHF antenna, and we are receiving, for example, telecommands from this UHF antenna. And this is then, for example, and this is then forwarded with an I2C bus to the actual um, co command and data handling system. And in and by itself, the code that I'm showing you is actually not too interesting um, because uh, it's basically just taking a frame and taking a frame length and repackaging it. Um, but it will be interesting later on because does some usual network stuff like network to host, like some 32-bit conversion that is like everywhere in, uh, in network applications. And it, it takes up a lot of space. But interestingly, the, the function that is like doing this end to h 32 conversion is actually doing nothing. So all of this is bad or is like basically useless code. So this will be some free real estate that we can work with later on, just so you keep that in mind. Um, and that's always good to have. Okay, so let's look at the first space protocol um, in this whole stack. So the first space protocol that we'll be looking at is the so-called LIPCSP. That is the LIPCubeSat space protocol. And we'll be looking at version one. There's also now a pretty new version two, which fixed most of these issues, but uh, we'll be looking at that first. So it's a very much TCP IP oriented design. So you can already see it's like you have a source address, you have a destination address, just a few by, uh, bits, but you don't need so many bits anyways. Like it, it's not like you have 4.3 billion satellites in your own fleet, so what do you need 32 bits for? Um, and then we have like a destination port and source port so that multiple applications on your satellite can receive the telecommands and uh, answer to them accordingly. And then you also have some interesting bits like an HMAC that you can enable and an XTR encryption that you can enable. And that is a nice idea. Um, so because the entire protocol actually does support HMAC SHA-1 authentication and also XTR encryption. Um, but there are some issues with that. Um, first of all, the, the MAC comparison leaks timing data. It's just a loop that compares bytes and for those aware, like if you do it this way, then basically you can send a wrong signature and the loop will exit early. And if you do this, then you have a small timing side channel for a few instructions that have not been executed. And when you do like a mem compare um, on these like, on for example, this specific architecture with this specific implementation, then you can leak or then you can iterate each individual authentication byte, and if it's correct, then there is a one more loop iteration executed. And if you do that, then you can, with a few thousand iterations, maybe you need a few more because up satellite is up in space and it might add some noise, I heard. Um, then you can find out the authentication or you can basically forge a signature, like you're sending just zero bytes and then you're iterating the first byte and so on. Um, then there's another issue, and these are all GitHub issues, um, and there are probably more. I, I don't know. I didn't review it, but those are just GitHub issues. Um, then there is an HMAC that uh, doesn't protect the actual header, so you can, for example, change whatever the, the port of the entire thing and just send the same packet to a different service. Also not optimal, I'd say. Um, the CSE checks also don't apply, but not so important. More interestingly is that the XTR encryption uses a nonce that is generated like this. 
So just from a rant, that is probably everybody that had like a security class in that, y you know that this is not how you do it, but that's how they do it in the library. Um, so they're basically all of these like security measures that they implemented have basically the super like starting problems that many crypto implementations had in the some time ago, let's say it like that. The author said that in version two it's fixed. Um, we'll see about that, but we are looking at this version. But interestingly, none of this matters um, because all the measures are disabled via compile time anyways. Like, why would you worry about it then anyways? Um, so when you try to send these packages, you just get some messages that uh, Xtia encrypted packet support is just not implemented, and same for HMAC. So the satellite doesn't even support it. And to go on, like the, the UHF component that is actually the, the radio also doesn't support any like encryption authentication. So basically this entire command stack is unprotected. Like if you know how to formulate these commands, you can take control of the satellite basically right after this talk. Um, please don't. All right. So, um, and the other way, th on th and the other point on how you actually implement this library is basically with a regular socket API TCP based ports. All familiar with that, you basically do a you basically have a socket, you do bind, you do listen, you do accept, read, destination port, close. Pretty standard stuff, but that's exactly how you do it on the satellite, for example, for, or for this specific library. Pretty interesting and makes the code reading pretty straightforward as well. Can recommend. Um, and another thing that the library brings with it is, interestingly, some several default handlers. The library author said that they are um, uh, like inspired by ICMP handlers. So you have like a network information handler where the routes are, you have like a ping task, you can get an operating system li uh, task list, that's also what we'll be doing in the, in the um, live demo. You can ask for remaining memory and you can also do a system reboot. So, and interestingly, if you look at all these commands, um, they basically are all kind of get commands. Like you get some information from this from the satellite except the system reboot command. And the system reboot command is the only command that has like a, let's call it security measure, because the first few bytes of the packet are compared against the byte sequence that I did not include in the presentation. Um, and then it does a system reboot. So at least like this library author tried, they didn't exactly know how to do it, I guess, but uh, this is another like try to like compare these bytes. Obviously it's not written like that, it's a mem com compare, but uh, you get the hang of it. And then there are many more services. So in the top corner, you can see where we are at. We first looked at this like I2C implementation, then at this like uh, CubeSat space protocol implementation. Now we're looking at the command handlers that are on the actual satellite. So if like a central service where there's like a, the, the CSP default services, and you have like a parameter service. So these, para these satellites usually have like a pretty big uh, parameter database of like tens of thousands of parameters so that you can upload or that you can basically update at any time. For example, when they, they have temperature sensors, they're uh, just loading this into this, uh, into this database and you can read it from there. And then there's also a interesting CSP process received SPP function. And what this does is it basically redirects the packet to the lower command stack that we'll be looking at afterwards. And then we also have this thing. Uh, this is the ADCS server, so the Attitude Determination Control server. So this controls this like thing that rotates the satellite. So you have thing like you can set a different mode. Um, you can, can, for example, turn on the GPS. You can set the like ADCS wheel position. So these like the turning in space works with some some wheel and some physical magic. Um, and when you when you take a closer look at these, basically all they are doing is like byte parsing. So pretty like straightforward, like taking a few bytes from the packet and then the next byte. So like this, this really raw byte parsing. And this will be important later on, um, but just, just some observation. And finally, when you want to send a response back to Earth, uh, you're really just doing CSP send. So same as in the Linux API, as I said, like socket, bind, listen, whatever, and there's also a send. And that's basically all you do to like and respond in time to a telecommand packet in this in this upper stack that we just talked about. And now we're going through the lower stack, which is quite different. Um, for example, the, the we are looking first at the like telecommand processing and then afterwards at the telemetry imitation process. Um, so first of all, this stack uses an S-band antenna and signals from the experimenter. So from the experimenter in your Java application, you can send telecommand requests to this, um, like, to the, to the actual bus system to find out 
what is the time, where are you at, what is the, how many battery time is left. So you can send telecommands from this like experimenter platform that is untrusted to this system. And it's also receiving commands from this S-band antenna. And interestingly, we have like can so we, we have a can bus here, not an I square C bus anymore. And uh, probably many here are familiar with how a CAN bus works. Basically, you can send a start package and then you start a new um, oh, this is not supposed to appear yet. Um, and then you basically start a new like frame transmission. You send the first frame, and this frame is then added to this like data global Rx data. So you copy it in and then you update the size. And then you can send a continuation packet, so you just also copy this into this like data global Rx data buffer, and you can do this any number of times, and until you send a frame time or frame type end thing. It's also copied in there, and then there's some flex set that the telecommand is complete. And what is missing there is basically checking that um, it's only 1,000 bytes, because that's how many bytes are in this buffer global one, which is like this data global Rx data thing points to this buffer global, and you can send from this like payload thing however many packets you want. Also more than the 1,000 byte that you're supposed to send, and then you can start overwriting, for example, this like SPP buffer, right? sounds pretty interesting, or this like telecommand packet buffer if you send enough bytes. Um, that's certainly pretty helpful. Um, Nobody probably thought of that somebody might send bigger packets than you want to send in the first place. All right, let's look at the actual packet stack. And this is going to be a little bit more difficult than this like libcsp thing from the beginning. Um, because this entire stack of telecommands uses this so-called CCSDS protocol stack. That, that is a protocol stack that is basically standardized by pretty much every space agency in the world since the 80s. So there are a few protocols at this point. Um, I never counted them, but it fell to me like dozens, um, like 50, 60, I'm not entirely sure. Like They basically built their own internet for all kinds of stuff. Um, so for example, you have like a, you have even protocols below this layer, and then you have like a synchronization channel coding sublayer, which already has several protocols. This is probably the smallest layer, with which only has four protocol options. So even if you just want to implement telemetry and uh, telemetry and uh, t uh, telecommand stuff, you already have to implement two protocols here. And then you have the option to go into like this bigger CCSDS branch uh, with the space packet protocol. This is SPP thing that I mentioned earlier. Or you can use internet protocols, because why not? Um, and when you go up these layers, there are so many protocols, like there is a special protocol for Earth observation satellites, there's a special protocol for file handling, there is a special message abstraction layer for all kinds of services that we'll be closer looking at in a, in a few minutes. Um, and really, they, they implemented so many protocols that probably nobody really has an idea anymore how many protocols there even are. And one security protocol, one. Um, and be going through this in a moment as well. Um, for us, it's only interesting this like space packet protocol and this message abstraction layer, and we are starting with the like space packet protocol. So if anybody here will ever have anything to do with satellites, there is a pretty good chance that you will encounter this protocol. Like I uh, can almost guarantee you, um, the space packet protocol has is actually a rather simple structure. You have like a primary header, you have an optional secondary header, and then some user data. Pretty straightforward, and then you did the. the Primary header extends to like a packet version number, which is at this point some not really a version number anymore, I'm not sure. Um, and then some packet identification. So, for example, what kind of packet type is it? Is there a secondary header and an application process ID? So, for example, you might have multiple services on a satellite. It's kind of akin to like this port system on the other library. So, you might have five different listeners on the satellite, and with this application process ID, you can decide where the packet goes to. Then you have like a packet sequence control, where you have a sequence flag, like is it a single packet, is it a multiple packet, is it the start, the end, the middle, and so on, like a sequence counter and a length field. So also pretty straightforward, actually. And when this kind of packet is received, we are going through this like parsing verification execution loop. Basically, we're first cleaning the buffers, we are reading a new command, we are verifying the command, and then executing it. And the read command is um, shown here. So basically, we are getting some packet uh, received from our from our CAN bus, from the from the S band antenna, or from the payload system. And then we basically take the current command, check, or we go through a like list of commands. There are about 20 empty ones. Um, might, some might not be empty, and then you check if it's empty. And you're reading this like space packet protocol thing header in there. Uh, you're it's basically passing the header 
checking if all the fields make sense, and then copies it into the actual like G telecommand and process thing. And if that worked, then the current state is uh, it has read in a command. And to ex actually execute the command, we need another protocol. Actually, that's it has multiple standards that are just for this thing, the message abstraction layer. Um, the idea behind this is that you have to that you have standardized data types, like you have a U short, U long, blah blah. You also have a URI, you have a blob, you have a time, you have like quality of service level instructions. You have like a pretty long list of like standardized data types. Um, and then you also have uh, standardized ways of interaction. So you have like you can send you can send a send command, you can a submit command, a request command, invoke, and so on. So basically, the the idea is that they wanted to like standardize all the interactions so they can build basically on a f like foundation of telecommands. And that and when you do this, you. you basically get a gigantic stack of like this message abstraction layer and like services that are operating on this and then you have service providers and it gets really complicated and you need multiple standards to read this and until you understand this. Um, but it's not so, un unfortunately we have to like not look into this. So at this, at this point, we basically have to just look at like two points. Uh, there are service areas, so you can define like general service area like event monitoring and then you can define a specific operation. And then you can send a command, for example, I want to like submit to like the service area that is written here with this specific operation. And then you can, for example, do event monitoring. Or in a different uh, operation, you can submit an action. And there are also, th there are many more. For example, create a new file, remove a file, write a file, read file, and so on. So this is basically the interface. It's a, a lot less like a switch statement that just compares the first byte of the packet and more like an actual elaborate packets or like a protocol that is actually de having actual fields, if that makes any sense. Um, and if we are looking then, for example, at a, let's say, for example, submit, cr uh, submit create file thing, then we can see that we are also not parsing just the first byte and then doing like a regular C and thing on to, to like pass the for the, the like first bit of it. Instead, we have like properly defined functions like MAL, like this message abstraction layer, read Boolean, and then we give in the, in the message, the offset in the message, how long it is, and then it parses the like boolean out of it. So this looks already a lot saner than what we have seen in the other, where there's just a YOLO, we pass whatever byte we want out of this. Um, and with that, they also continue, like you can read a string, and then if you have the string, you can actually have actually like a nice length field, and it, it looks actually quite sane. And in, in this specific example, for example, uh, we see that you're first getting a boolean. Do we want to get, for example, an accept acceptance report? And it did ca in this case, we emitted a telemetry packet that acknowledges that we have received a command and we are working on it. And if we then go on, we actually read another boolean value and a file name. And then we use, for example, a file name to construct a path on the satellite. Um, and then we do an F open on the system. And finally, we write a response, like we write an integer, write a Boolean to the response packet, and then we send this like response message, the final like everything worked or ev nothing worked back to the ground station. And this is basically the telecommand stack. Um, it's, uh, it, it uses these like really standardized CCSDS protocols like SPP, the message abstraction layer. It's a lot more elaborate than like this hacky C stack that we have seen on the top. Um, and, the tele and the telemetry stack is kind of the same story. So we are looking now at this like telemetry stack here. And the important part is like in the here, we just had basically called the CSP send function. This was sending the packet right back down to Earth. Um, here we have an actually elaborate mechanism where we can send a packet. And it actually checks where we currently are and where we are trying to send this packet. So for example, if we are sending it to the payload back, we can send it anytime, no problem. Um, but if we're actually not in the range of any ground station, then we have to actually store the packet. Um, and oh, where is it? There we are. Then we can actually store the packet. For example, we do the send packet. And then we can, for example, see that we want to add it to the live store, which is basically just a short term buffer for like a few seconds, for example, if you're sending many packets. But they're all linked down to Earth uh, right at this time. Or you can send it to like a packet store, and then it saves it on a flash memory until it's in range for a new uh, telemetry submission again. Um, because these satellites usually, j since they are so 
close to Earth, they always just see a very small part of the Earth. So you al that also means that you have that you're not always in range of a ground station. Um, so this makes things a lot more difficult for this part. Interestingly, the top layer did not use this, but we'll be talking about that. All right. So this is the telemetry part. Like it's a uh, it's a lot more elaborate with its like online and offline storage, and uh, this has a reason. So as I said, like this top part. Like it, it was a rather straightforward protocol, like a small uh, GitHub repository that is like trying to implement a protocol, and then there was like all kinds of C parsing. So it looked like somebody just wrote it together in a not not so long time frame, I'd say. Um, and then it's like lower part looks a lot more elaborate. Like it has a mechanism to check where you are. Can you actually emit the packet now? Do I have to save it? And can I? And it implemented this like super standardized thing that is like probably 10 times the code to achieve the same thing, um, which is pretty interesting. So why is this the case that we have these two different stacks? And keep in mind like this, that the top stack, this one, was able to send packets down to this stack, but not the other way around. So this top stack also offers a lot more telecommands than the bottom stack. So from a command and control perspective, this offers a lot more functionality, even though this stack is a lot more elaborate, which is kind of counterintuitive. Like why would you, why would your like secondary command and control channel be the elaborate one and the like main channel the hacky one? Um, and this actually has an interesting reason. So this like CSP stack, the upper stack, is used by the actual operators. It's all used to operate the satellites, and these operators have their ground station in one specific location. Though I would assume that ESA is more than one specific uh, location. So when these operators send some some uh, some telecommands to the satellite then it's right and above the ground station. That means that when the satellite responds to this very telecommand, it's still usually in the range of this like ground station that it was talking to. It's just a 10 to 20 minute time window, but still, where like they send this command and they, they are still in the um, range of this ground station, so you can still receive this package. But it's a different story for this, for, for this lower stack, the like space protocol stack. There, the, the traffic or the, te the, the like telecommands to find out some information about the state of the satellite. They either, come they either come from the payload, so it might be at any time, um, or they come from experimenters. So experimenters can also place their S-Bahn antenna somewhere and talk to the satellite themselves if they, if ESA enabled the antenna and they are allowed to do it, um, but also when they're not allowed to do it. Um, and then they can talk to it. But this might be at any point in the Earth, uh, at any point, whatever, and there might not be a ground station to like receive the telemetry packets, and ESA might want to receive these telemetry packets to monitor what people are doing on their satellite. Um, so there is a need to like store these packets and to actually like have a standardized way because so many people are intended to like talk with this, this thing that you have to do like a standardized approach that is like properly documented. You can't like publish these people like these hacking commands of the top stack. Um, you have to do it like properly actually. And there's also this like unknown time frame there's this like unknown time frame on when people actually send this kind of stuff. Um, so that's why you need like an online and offline storage. All right, let's look at the actual security analysis. So we've already seen some, some interesting things and we'll be putting them together here. Um, so just a recap, you want to find a bypass communications protection. Uh, we, we want to bypass the communications protection. We want to find the dangers of vulnerability C. We don't really want to do a firmware update. We want to hijack the bus control flow and finally do like a we want to take full bus privileges. All right, so let's first check where we can do our bypass com communications protection. Um, so we've already seen in this like upper stack that, or I, I told you that the UHF component itself doesn't have any security measures, and we have seen that the security measures of libcsp in the specific version are pretty lacking and disabled, unfortunately for us and unfortunately for them anyway. So that's pretty good. Um, Next thing we need is a dangerous or vulnerable telecommand. And um, usually satellites have like some kind of mem copy telecommand. Um, and when I say usually, I mean all the other satellites that I've seen, or most of them. Um, and that's basically to like hot patch, it's like a simple hot patch mechanism, like you can patch your, you don't have to upload a full new image or set, it might take days or weeks. So this is an easy way to fix stuff. You can also do some debugging with it, you can change configuration quickly without having a dedicated telecommand. So many people are building, for example, this kind of thing that's from a different satellite, um, where they take like this, these command arguments, which are just a few bytes from the packets, and then just input it into like a mem copy. So really, the first few bytes are just treated as an address 
then the, there is the start of the data buffer and how many bytes you want to read. So basically, mem copy API. Pretty useful. Doesn't help us here because this satellite doesn't have it, or at least I didn't find it. Um, so we need to find or look for something else. For example, vulnerable telecommand. Um, why would we be looking for this? So I already said that we have this like upper stack that can talk to the lower part, and I already elaborated that we have like this super elaborate standardized stuff in the bottom part, and it's like custom byte parsing in the top, so maybe let's have a look there. Um, fortunately for us, we did find something there. Um, for example, when we in this like CubeSat space protocol stack to the ADCS server, that's the stuff that I showed you earlier, where we have this like nice listen, bind, accept, read. There is also a set log file function, and that basically takes like after the 15th byte of the data um, of the of the packet, it parses with string cat or well, it, it moves with string cat things into a log file name and it is 32 bytes long. So that's, that's as straightforward as it gets um, regarding any textbook exploitation. And this is what we found here. Pretty interesting. Um, and this is also all we need for our vulnerable telecommand because with that, well it's, a it's a stack buffer overflow into we can overwrite the PC. But usually that's not enough. In this case, uh, fortunately for us, it is. Um, because the next step would be hijack bus control flow, but Usually, if you do like, if you find this kind of vulnerability on a Linux device, um, this might not be the end of things because you have uh, ASLR. Not in this case. We also don't have like non-executable stacks because why would we? Um, and then we also have no software defenses like stack cookies um, because we didn't have the first one anyway. So why bother? I guess. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. So we can get with like a textbook buffer overflow command execution on a satellite. Cool. Um, but we shouldn't be at root privileges already, right? Yes, we are, because it's a privilege-free auto system. Uh, there is not even a concept of like privileges. There's no root, or there, there, are different, there are not different users. It's just different threads that are running. So if you have code execution, this is as far as it gets. So one buffer overflow is basically enough to like seize, con seize control of the satellite in a like one packet manner. Pretty cool. All right. Um, so how do we do this in detail? Um, first, we have to hijack the control flow. Um, and as I said, this is the vulnerable function. So we are, oh, sorry, that's wonderful. This is the vulnerable function, and we are overriding the stack. Pretty easy, right? Unfortunately not, uh, because this is not a function, it's a task. The uh, difference is that a task never returns. So overriding the, uh, the address of something that never returns is, well, make a guess, it doesn't return. Um, so that's pretty unfortunate. So this buffer overflow looks like it's useless. Fortunately for us, um, it's not. Why is it? Yeah. Um, so we've seen this like upper part already, and then it's construct. And after this like actual trigger of the buffer overflow, we are writing some more stuff. Like we are writing the like log data response packet. We are writing some stuff in there. We get some um, data, uh, uh, like timing data, like a and then we finally call a function called GS ADCS log start. And we're giving it this like corrupted buffer that has a way too long string in it. And fortunately for us, this is like basically how the function looked. Like it has a 60 byte sprint buffer, um, and we are just parsing an undelimited like string length string into this buffer. So we have a second buffer overflow. Um, so because the first one was not good enough, we have a second one right after. Fortunately for us, that fixed our problem of not having a buffer overflow. Cool. All right. Next thing we need is what kind of jump address do we write into this uh, PC? Um, unfortunately, I didn't find any like jump ESP that you would do in x86. Um, so the other thing that I did was we have like this TC buffer. So basically, there's like a buffer of 20 telecommands that, has, that are that have been received but haven't been processed yet. So we can just, for example, take the address of the first one because all the addresses are static. There's no MMU. There's no ASLR. There's there's nothing. So we can just take whatever static address of buffers we want. That's pretty pretty helpful for us in this case. All right. Next thing we want to do is like patch the firmware. Right? Like we want to lock out whoever is actually owning the satellite. So what we're doing is we are constructing basically the addresses that we need. And for that, we basically moving so that there is no four-byte move command in this in, in AVR32. 
So what we're doing is in the, like we do a move higher part, so we write a like upper two bytes of this register and subtract th something from that. And with this, you can basically write a four byte value in two instructions. And then we set up the addresses and then we have uh, just a pretty normal loop that is copying everything that is like coming afterwards to a specific location. And um, which location might that be? Um, so we found a interesting location previously, like there's like free real estate that nobody seems to care about. Uh, so let's maybe just patch that. So we're just hot patching the running firmware to like this packet. Um, we're basically just doing an XOR with like this thing on the header. And with that, you have to basically XOR this like 0x that beef on every packet header that you're sending. Otherwise, the packet is guarded because it's well, not just a garbage packet. Um, that's pretty lucky for us because now we have basically patched in a like password mechanism without like struggling with how to append code or anything like that. All right. So now I'm trying to do the demo. Well, not now, uh, in a minute or so. Um, so first, how does the like emulation that we are that we are using for this like exploitation, how does it work? So we're using Camo and we're using the AVR32 um, instruction set, and then we basically are running the software in in this instruction set, and we also implemented many of the like mock sensors. We have like our simulation agent that is like basically a TCP server running um, that is like receiving our packets um, and sending us telemetry, and it's basically acting as a UHF module on the satellite. It's sending stuff on the I square C bus as the real hardware would do, and um, also providing some sensor values, but doesn't matter at this point. And for those that are familiar with Kemo, they know there's no AVR32 architecture in this. Um, lucky for us, or lucky for me, I had a student that implemented the full architecture from the ground up to fully working in, uh, in his master thesis. And he also wrote several blog posts about how you to implement a new architecture from scratch in Kemo. So if you uh, ever want to go through this pain, um, knock yourself out and uh, read his blog post like he implemented it. Um, also, all the like I square C, SPI, PDCA peripherals. So that's pretty neat for us. Um, finally, we have like the simulation agent. As I said, it's like a TCP server in Kemo. It writes a packet to like this I square C bus, and it's basically doing the same as the like hardware on this real satellite would be doing. All right. So um, I have a video if this doesn't work, because there's a chance it doesn't, <laughs> because it's a live demo, and I might have not sacrificed enough things to the demo god. All right, so first thing we are doing is starting the emulation. And after some setup time, we can see that basically after this initial setup, the only thing that the satellite is doing is like reading temperature, reading gyroscope, reading compass, and that's basically from there on all the satellite is doing because it's, it's set up, it's all good in space, um, so now it's time to read sensors. So next thing we do, oh, uh, is, sorry, let's request a task list from the satellite just to see that everything is working. So this is like a Python script that is using this like TCP interface that I previously mentioned. Oh, that's Yes, I can try that. Um. Here you go. All right. Um. So let's try this again without this. And we're sending a command, and we've already seen in like the simulation that uh, emu the emulation that some, uh, something was received, and we have received a task list from the satellite. Um, so we can see that there's like this ADCS task running, there's like some idle task that has apparently 250% of the usage. Um, that's because the timer is a bit balked. Uh, we have some initialization process still running. We have like a board task, we have like a blinking task because an LED is blinking in space uh, for fun. Um, and yeah, this is basically, so this is working. All right, so let's try sending, uh, the actual exploit. Sorry, jumping too much. Okay, not entirely sure if this worked. It might. So let's 
So now we patched in basically this like password mechanism. And sorry, I'm jumping too much. Um, and if we send this thing now again, like the task list, it shouldn't work because like now we should do like a, we should have to like add this like zero x dead beef onto the packet header. And as we see, like it clearly received the packet and it didn't respond to it because it doesn't have the password and it's the same like task list, but we didn't receive a response. So, so far so good. Um, and if we send this task list again, but this time, oops, sorry. But this time at this zero x dead beef basically as like a x or onto the header. We're not receiving a response, though we should be. All right, back to the video, because the demo gods are not favorable. All right, so this is uh, from a student that implemented the AVR32 architecture. Unfortunately, I cannot increase it, I'm sorry. Um, so we are starting the satellite, same as for me, like we, we see that there is stuff running, um, and then he also requested the same, ooh, sorry. Oh. And then he also requested a task list, and we can see that all the like tasks are there. Um, if we see like a j sensor board, we, we can see like the, the blinking task again, some board task. Um, oh, I'm not sure about that. And in the next step, he's sending the actual exploit. And this shouldn't get any big response because it's just a like set do a set stuff on the satellite. And in his example, we can see shell code called, some intrinsics for like that. I know that the demo is working. Um, and then if he sends the like task list again, it doesn't work like it didn't for me because it shouldn't work. And then finally, if he adds this like zero x dead beef, the password basically onto the header, then he receives the task list is again. So. This definitely does work, um, and in fact, ESA has approached us if we can actually do it on a satellite, so that they have a password on the satellite. That's pretty interesting. All right. Um, so this was as straightforward as it gets. Like we are on a reverse engineering and conference, and I just showed you like a 90 style buffer overflow to t overtake a satellite. Um, yeah, but this is the reality, and it shouldn't be that easy. Um, so what might be interesting like exploitation scenarios in the future? Um, so there's an issue of like cosmic radiation basically degrading all kinds of hardware in space. Um, so in the future we might see attacks against like degraded satellites. They, they are like out of service, you want to take them over, um, but for example a flash is not really working anymore because half the regions are destroyed by cosmic radiation. Um, or you might see l very limited time attack windows, as I said you have just have like 10 minutes before the satellite is like leaving the horizon again. Or we might be seeing like combined attacks of where you like um, do some kind of like sensor attack to like increase the temperature so that the satellite goes into some emergency state. So I think you can do pretty interesting stuff that is not necessarily the same on Earth. Um, but we are not there yet. Like we still have to do implement, we still have to implement passwords and ASLR to get there. Um, yeah. All right. Let's talk about some lessons learned that you, I hope, uh, maybe learned in this talk. Um, so first of all, to recap, firmware attacks on satellites are a thing. So it's, it's not this like Viasat incident, that was a completely different story, it's hyper satellite security, it technically is, um, but it's completely independent from what we did here. Um, I've shown you that many of the like satellite protocols lack basic security, as I said, like the say CCSCS protocol has one security protocol, but it doesn't do key exchanges, it, it's really just encrypting and authenticating one block of data. Um, we have seen that, or I, I told you that many re still rely on security by obscurity, mostly by you don't know how it works, so it's secure, which is suboptimal. We have seen this interesting, like complex telecommand and telemetry pipeline, um, where we have this, this like dual command pipe or this dual pipeline for different purposes, um, and we've also seen that there are many missing state-of-the-art defenses, so no ASLR, no stack cookies, no whatever. Um, and this leads to a single buffer overflow reading leading to remote code execution and finally to a full satellite takeover. And really the only thing that prevents us from carrying this out is basically we need access to a ground station. We do have access to a ground station, so we could do it. It's, it's not like there's something magical in between. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention.
Do we have any questions? Can you get the mic? It, it is open source. Um, uh, the, the, like, almost everything is open source already. The Slack like, simulation agent is missing, but uh, AVR32 is open source. You can use it anytime. And people are already using it to emulate the same hardware for satellite development. Um, how common is uh, like firmware reuse across the industry? Like, are, are these space agencies making like bespoke ones, or is this pretty common, like a vulnerability you might see across a lot of different satellites? So for like, it, it really depends. For example, I reckon that big companies that are launching constellations, should it, I, I, I assume they are reusing stuff. Um, also many like new space companies, they're for example selling like this bus system as a like one in a unit, you just put it on your satellite and you're good and I'm assuming there's most of the time the same bus system running. But there are many, many, many of these companies. So um, there is reusage, but like it's it's not like they are just three satellite operating systems and stuff like that. Hi. So have we hit the point where there are any like common reference implementations of these protocols, like the space protocol, or is, is it a situation where everyone's sort of rolling their own from scratch? From Excellent PDFs? question. Um, there is for the CCSDS stuff. There is an implementation in Java. Um, which is awesome for satellites that are run in C. Um, it's, I guess, more intended for ground stations. But for like, if you if you try to implement a satellite uh, based on CCSDS, you will have a hard time. There is no default implementation. Um, and part of the problem is that first of it's dozens of protocols. Um, but the other part of the issue is that the spec says that many things are optional or optional length and stuff like that. So. Really, you have to basically do like a, you're implementing this specific sub-spec of the standard in my protocol. Um, so this is also an issue. And in interestingly, to go on about this in a paper, we analyzed this as well. And we have seen that the smaller a project is, the more likely they are to just implement their own protocol with like four fields and don't even bother with the standardized protocol. And only when you are in the like multi-million dollar project with like 50 people, you even start to consider using the standard. Um, which is maybe not a great indicator for usability of the standard. Yeah. All right. Um, that's it. Uh, if any more questions are, uh, I, I'll be outside and you can ask me there.